Okay. Uh, so today the we are going to the goals of our uh, discussions is going to change completely. We are going to talk about response. <clears throat> so let me remind you: we first do we we first have a control system, then we design a controller, then we design attack detection scheme, and then we design response scheme. So the reason why you have to respond to an attack is because all the other countermeasures that you had has completely failed. So you could have countermeasures such as encryption decryption, you could have countermeasures such as uh, private network, you could have countermeasures such as firewalls, and all of those countermeasures have failed, and you still have an intruder in the system who is causing some sort of problem within the system. Now, now, once you have an intruder, the first thing you have to do is detect the intruder, which is what we were discussing so far. We know a lot of detection algorithms now. Uh, you could come up with much simpler detection algorithms. We, of course, in the class, I have talked about all the things that are very complicated, like all the complicated detection algorithms. You can always come up with simpler detection algorithms for the applications that you may be worried about or you, you may be considering. Uh, but since you guys are paying for your tuition, my goal is to give you all the difficult things so that you can use it in your future uh, and, and leave the easy things for you to figure out on your own, right? That's why you're paying me uh, tuition, right? So, so now, again, uh, you can come up with simpler response schemes, but we are going to talk about all the difficult response schemes in the class, okay? Once again, because you're paying me, so I have to give you complicated equations on the board. Otherwise, what's the point? Okay. So now, remember, this is a control system. We have an actuator. We have a plant or the system. We have a sensor. And the sensor sends information via a channel. How do I show a channel? Let me show a channel like this. Channel, this is CAN bus. This is Wi-Fi, this is Ethernet, and so on. SCADA, uh, I don't know, you could have any number of different uh, communication protocols here. Then it goes to uh, the control, controller and detector. and then it issues the actuation command which goes to the actuator. Okay, and everything that is smart in this particular diagram is susceptible to an attack. So you have your vehicle, and you have a radar, which is a sensor which figures out what the vehicle's velocity is around you, and, or, and what the distance with that vehicle is. And one could spoof the radar, uh, the electromagnetic waves that the radar is capturing, one can spoof that, and that's a sensor that gets spoofed, because it's a smart sensor. I mean, it's not really a smart sensor, but you, you understand what I'm saying. It's getting information from the outside, and therefore you can spoof that particular signal that it's getting. GPS sensors are very, very susceptible to attack. In fact, there was a uh, talk in ESL, Electroscience Lab, maybe like a couple of weeks back, or maybe like last week, where the researcher, Professor Zach Casas, was talking about uh, GPS spoofing, and how do you measure what the state of your vehicle is if your GPS signal gets spoofed. I, I don't know, how any, did any of you attend that particular talk? You did attend the talk, right? So his problem was you have a vehicle that's going on the road or you have a UAV that's flying and the GPS, GPS signal gets spoofed. So he came up with a strategy 
He didn't work on the detection part. The detection was probably easy for him to detect that the GPS signal is spoofed. But he came up with a estimation scheme to figure out what the vehicle, where the vehicle is, but that estimator had an error of the order of 30 meters. Can you drive an autonomous vehicle where your estimation error is 30 meters? We can't, right? So, so GPS, GPS signals are susceptible to spoofing, and once it's spoofed, you have to detect the spoofing, but once it's spoofed, you have detected it, now you have to come up with a response scheme in his case, his response was to come up with a better estimator. That's what he was working on. That's his research. Um, but if you are in an autonomous system, you, after the estimation is complete, you still have to control the vehicle. And the question is, how do you control the vehicle? Well, you estimate the state. You estimate your position with some error. But then you also have camera. You have LIDAR. You have other sensors and you try to make sense of the world based on all the other sensors that you have. And what typically people do in, in, uh, in actual production systems is they have like, uh, they assign a, uh, what is that score called? Uh, trust score, trust score. So they assign a trust score to every sensor. So I'm going to trust my camera more at this moment and I'm going to trust my GPS less at this moment, right? So say they, they have this uh, trust score that they assign to every sensor that is providing them with data. And in the case of an attack, one of the sensors will have low trust, other sensors will have higher trust, and they are going to make the decision based on the trust score, uh, aggregate trust score of all the sensors that they have on the system. Then you have this communication channel and among all kinds of attack, the attacks on the channel is the easiest one to launch. And, because, and that's because most of the attacks are happening through uh, wireless mediums. And you can always buy uh, uh, signal emitters, like antennas or, or some sort of uh, transponders, which can jam the channel at which you are communicating. And therefore, Whenever you have a wireless channel, it's very easy to uh, spoof, not spoof, but actually jam, like drop the entire information packet in that channel. So the reason why you can jam the GPS is because GPS signal is so weak, because you know, so satellites are like up in the space, 400 kilometers above the ground or, or, or even higher. And uh, the signal is pretty weak. All you need is a small device which can overpower the signal at that particular frequency. Very easy to make. In fact, probably you can go to Amazon and you can buy $40 worth of uh, microcontrollers and, and antennas and whatnot, and you can come up with your, you can devise your own GPS spoofing device. Okay, it's not that difficult. And I'm sure you will find some tutorials online on, on Google on how to build such devices. So anything where communication is happening over a wireless medium, very easy to spoof not spoof, sorry, uh, jam the signal completely. When you have a wired device, which is a CAN bus or Ethernet, well, Ethernet means that it's connected to the internet, but when you have a, uh, when you have a CAN bus, then you need an infected microcontroller to be connected to that particular communication medium, okay? Now, we have talked about this vehicle example quite a lot. It's not that difficult for a garage mechanic to change the ECU on your car if you go to that store, I mean, go to that mechanic shop, they can always change the ECU, which can send spurious signals on the CAN bus and therefore cause an attack in the communication channel. The SCADA systems, the attacks that I am aware of, they have been actually very, very sophisticated or they have been attacked due to internal employees. So some employee who was angry at his or her boss they just attack the system remotely because they knew exactly how the SCADA system is communicating and working. So insider involvement in attacks is a big challenge in SCADA systems. SCADA systems are used for all the critical infrastructure. So your sewage treatment plant, generation, uh, transformers, you know, substations, they are all SCADA systems. Uh, they all communicate over uh, a, a local network, which is a SCADA system and an insider can tell you how to attack the system, for instance. So you can attack the channel, you can drop information in the channel, uh, 
and then you go to the controller detector. Of course, you can have a virus here. You can, you can install a virus or a worm. So the famous one is the Stuxnet worm, which was at the controller level on, on, a, computer, uh, on, a, on a computer that was controlling the centrifuge. That was in Iran in 2008-2009, so about 12 years back. So this one is susceptible to virus and worms. And then, of course, the channel, it is susceptible to packet drops, information drops. The actuators, I think actuators typically are mechanical device. So, so there is very little chances of corrupting an actuator unless you, are, you have a hammer in your hand and you are actually physically attacking the system. Uh, but I may be wrong. Maybe there are actuators that can be attacked remotely. Uh, I, I just am not aware of them. So sensors, very easy to attack. Packet drops, easy to attack. Uh, addition of worms or firewall, I mean addition, adding viruses or worms to the controller slash detector. Uh, I don't want to say it's easy to do, but it can be done. All you need is an infected ECU to, uh, infected USB drive to connect to the computer, which can then uh, infect the computer with a virus where most of the controllers reside. And then you can have packet drops here, and then you have the actuator and the plant, okay? So these are the different types of, so I'm going to talk about like very complicated, not complicated, but the attacks that have been studied in the literature for which we have the response schemes. Uh, there are attacks for which there are no response schemes because nobody actually uh, thought about that. Or in most situations, this is the reason why we don't have response, adequate number of response schemes. It's because most of the companies are very close about the vulnerabilities in their system. They won't tell you what the vulnerabilities are. And that creates very difficult to come up with response schemes. Detection, you can come up with general purpose detection schemes. Response requires you to know what the attacker is going to do. So many companies are closed about that, and therefore we don't really have good uh, literature on the response schemes against attacks. Okay. So we are going to talk about estimation, control and estimation. with IID packet drops. This is the jamming. But I'm talking about intermittent jamming, not a continuous jamming. Let me write it as intermittent jamming. This is the subject, the first topic that we will study. Uh, sensor selection problem. And then some, uh, uh, some other robust control design approach. Oh, packet. So whenever sensors are communicating, whenever you are communicating things over a communication channel, you have to create a packet. So those are the bits that you are sending over the channel. So a packet is basically a sequence of bits. So it will start from like 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And it will be like maybe 64 bits long. It could be 8 bits long. It depends. But that's a packet.
okay so when you have continuous jamming then that jammer is very very powerful there is nothing much you can do so then the attack is successful you cannot help it that's it you, your role is finished when you have intermittent jamming which is the the jamming is happening at sort of random time intervals then there is something you can do which is what we are going to talk about and that's the assignment for assignment 3 that you are going to be working on so that's the intermittent jamming problem and we will uh look into how to design control strategies with intermittent jamming sensor selection problem is the gps example that i talked about so you have gps camera lidar radar maybe like seven or eight different types of sensors on a vehicle maybe acoustic sensors um and so the question is if one of the sensors or two sensors have gone bad how do you how do you select which of the sensors to trust and and use for making the decision so you have to estimate the state based on the other sensors and you have to um you have to uh, act upon the system because the system has to function it's an autonomous system the key thing to note here is you could have different you could have same but you could have multiple sensors of the same type or you could have multiple sensors of multiple type in the sensor selection problem so when i talk about gps you could have five different gps receivers communicating at different frequencies so if the jammer is only jamming two of the frequencies you still get information from three frequencies right so that's one kind of sensor selection problem where you have the same sensor but multiple sorry you have the same type of sensor but multiple sensors of that type so that uh, if some of the sensors have failed you can still use other sensors to make your decision the other type of sensor selection problem is you have completely different sensors one is camera one is infrared one is uh, radar so they are all sort of sensing different spectrums uh, and trying to make sense of what the external world looks like and that's another kind of sensor selection problem that one typically has to study so assuming some of the sensors have gone bad how do you select other sensors and design an estimation scheme in that situation and then you have what is known as robust or resilient control design approaches so sensor selection happens here control and estimation would happen here when this channel is under attack and then robust and resilient control design approaches will again sit here and the idea in robust or resilient are quite different so can someone tell me how what what exactly is the meaning of robust if something is robust what does that mean sorry uh, like in the last assignment we have so, checked, yeah we have taken the that varman uh, is robust to the c right so basically if you are changing changing c to higher or lower right the response of the varman is not going to change that way. right right okay so you are talking about the response of the system when you change certain parameters within the yeah, system right, so if we increase that input or something very like extreme input that system response is around the same around the same be. okay good good so even if you have extreme situations the system is behaving as it's supposed to behave actually in so mathematically the definition of robust and resilience are quite uh, uh, different so a robust so in a robust system so let's consider a uh, uh, you know we buy a cell phone cases right and some cell phone cases are called rugged cell phone cases so you know you can drop it you can put it in your pocket it's going to function exactly the same it's not going to make any difference so that's robust so what happens in a robust system is at the time of the design you design a robust system and then no matter what happens to the system the system is just going to function the way it is supposed to function okay that's a robust system in resilient system you design the system in a specific fashion but if it detects that something has changed it is going to switch its behavior okay so traditionally if you built an aircraft you wanted the aircraft to be robust okay nowadays you want the aircraft to be resilient not robust so robust means i have figured out these are the different disturbances that could be applied on the aircraft and this is the control strategy that will work well for all these different disturbances and that's that's how i'm going to control the system 
resilient is uh, if I'm taking off, this is the algorithm I'm going to use. If there is a gust going in this direction, then this is the algorithm I'm going to use. If there is a gust going in that direction, this is the algorithm I'm going to use. So it has basically different algorithms for different phases. But then you have to have a detection that something has gone wrong. And so you have to change your behavior. So that's resilient control. And resilient is the new, new keyword because robust leads to very suboptimal performance under all circumstances because it's not tuned, fine-tuned to a specific situation. Resilient means in every situation you are being optimal for that particular situation. So you are having much better performance. So a robust vehicle that is not susceptible to cyber attack would be a mechanical vehicle which is 1950s vehicle which will give you five gallons per mile no sorry five miles per gallon uh, mileage but it's a robust system because it's going to work you know uh, under any sort of attack because it's a mechanical system a resilient car would be a car which has lots of gadgets lots of connectivity like a modern car it will give you 30 35 miles per gallon if it is not attacked but if it is attacked it might go down to two gallons two miles per gallon or five miles per gallon based on how it is responding to that particular attack so nowadays people want resilient control not a robust control but nonetheless we need to understand that if a system is subject to a lot of different disturbances like an aircraft you want to have a robust design robust control design but you also want to have some sort of resiliency built into it in case something goes wrong. So, uh, so for most situations it will be robust, but for some situations it will become resilient. And as time progresses, I guess a lot of the robustness will move into resilience. So you are optimal under all circumstances. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, different control design approaches for robust versus resilient uh, control design. Any questions so far on the introductory topics? We have resilient control design. For each situation, we should have the detection algorithm. Yes. So it is kind of complicated than that. Exactly. It is resilient is far more complicated than robust. Okay. Robust means a single algorithm that is going to work on the system no matter what happens. And resilient means I'm going to detect based on the sensors. I'm going to detect if everything is going fine, then it's one algorithm. Something has gone wrong, then there is another algorithm and so on and so forth. Okay. <coughs> Any other question? Yes. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, does introducing this trust score uh, uh, in contribute towards an improvement? You know, I can't talk about it in general terms because I don't know. Uh, there is no like mathematical proof of that. But I will tell you that we did some work in the context of machine learning where uh, we assign trust scores to individual workers who are trying to learn or assist in learning some uh, classification or uh, regression problem. And in our algorithm, uh, we don't make any assumption of half of them being good or half of them being bad. We don't make any assumption because our trust scores automatically adjust. So if one uh, server has gone bad, it will be assigned a trust score of zero and therefore that server's input doesn't really matter to the to our training process. So if you ask me, our algorithm, our learning algorithm in that particular context doesn't require any of that 50% uh, uh, good, 50% bad kind of demarcation. But that's just the nature of the problem and our algorithm. Now, whether it can be generalized to any situation, I can't really say at this point of time, okay? Um, but it's a good point because all the older works, the classic, well, I shouldn't say classic because something that happened in 2015 is not really classic. But uh, uh, this problem that has been studied since 2005-ish, 
uh, you know, many a time the assumptions are made that 50%, more than 50% sensors are fine, and less than 50% sensors have gone bad for technical reasons, so their math will work. But, but we recently wrote a paper where it was not a sensor selection problem, it was a machine learning problem. And in that case, we didn't really have to make any assumption. So you could have as many number of adversaries, it's completely fine. In fact, we ran our uh, simulation with uh, only one legitimate worker and everyone else is adversary. Okay, and our algorithm worked. Worked in the sense that it is better than the, uh, it was better than other uh, algorithms in that particular area, so. Okay, any other question? Cool. So let's talk about intermittent controls problem control over lossy network This is new, by the way. And then I have yt is equal to cxt plus bt. Maybe I shouldn't use v. I should use something else. I think I have used nt in the past for observation noise. So let me just use nt. Okay, so all of these notations have the usual meaning. This is actuation noise. This is uh, observation noise. And nu t, iid, Bernoulli, new bar, random variable. So new t equals to zero with probability one minus new bar and equals to one with probability new bar. Oh, and I must say, this is uh, taken from the, so there is a handout uh, in the file section of Carmen with the name Sinopoli book. Uh, so this entire stuff, all the stuff that we are talking about response is taken from that book. So you can find the details in that particular book with the proofs and everything. <coughs> Okay, so what is happening here? I have the usual control system with the observation equation. This is the linear time invariant system, but there's a small twist. And the twist is I have a Bernoulli random variable here, nu t, which 
with probability with probability 1 minus nu bar it's equal to 0 with probability nu bar it's equal to 1 okay so i have a bernoulli random variable and what that means is sometimes this is equal to 0 sometimes this is equal to 1 when it is 1 it means that the control action went through the communication channel and changed the state of the system when it is equal to 0 it means that the control packet was dropped okay so the controller sent the packet to the plant or to the actuator but somewhere in the communication channel that packet was lost okay now you could have multiple situations by because of which the packet would get lost so for instance if you're controlling a rover on mars it's a long distance and you're sending some control command and that command can get lost in the space for some reason or it can get overpowered by some of the solar events that might be happening in that area in the communication medium or you could have this loss because the adversary is jamming the channel and so sometimes your packet goes through and sometimes your packet doesn't go through depending on the situation okay so this is our attack model the attack model is that my new t is iid bernoulli random variable and sometimes it takes value 1 with probability nu bar and it takes value 0 with probability 1 minus nu bar so with probability nu bar the action gets applied onto the system with probability 1 minus nu bar the packet gets dropped and the action is not applied to the system the goal for the controller is to minimize no minimize over gamma that maps x hat to u and this is expected value of summation d equals 0 to perhaps infinity you can have a finite horizon as well uh, let me write capital T xt transpose q xt plus nu t u t transpose r u t this is the usual tracking control and this was covered I think in lecture maybe seven or eight Oh, uh, and I must mention that Q is positive semi-definite and R is positive definite. Okay. So what's happening in this? I want my tracking. So XT is the error. Uh, so I want to go along some direction, like I want to be in the center of the lane, but my current position of the car may be close to the center, may be away from the center. So my xt, which is the state, is the deviation from the center of the lane. Okay, so that's my xt. I want my deviation to be small, but at the same time, I don't want to exert too much control effort. So I want my control cost to also be small. Okay. I don't want to do too much of uh, left and right driving in order to get to zero, uh, uh, zero deviation from the center of the lane. However, there is a twist here, which is when, you, when there is a packet drop in the channel, when there is a packet drop, then the control cost is zero. 
you don't because the control never got implemented uh, there is no cost incurred because of that so that's a twist in this particular problem we have a new t here which tells you that the control action was not applied therefore we didn't incur any cost associated with that action okay anyone remembers what did we use for solving the usual problem and there was no new t what exactly was the algorithm we used for solving this problem we did that derivation in maybe lecture 7 or 8 when i was talking about dynamic optimization dp dynamic programming so we used dynamic programming to solve this problem in that particular lecture if you go back you can you can find it so we can apply dynamic programming to this particular problem as well but now there is a twist with respect to the earlier formulation so the, there are two twists actually the first is now i have an actuation noise and an observation noise okay so i have noise added to the system and then the second part is that i have a packet drop in the control channel so i need to figure out how to control the system under this situation so we'll we'll talk about it right now how to do the computation there's another thing that i want you to note which is this matrix a here that we see so when the row of when the spectral radius is less than 1 the system is said to be stable and when the spectral radius rho of a is greater than 1 or equal to well not equal to but greater than 1 then it is unstable so there are two different types of system one are stable systems and the other ones are unstable system in unstable system your rho of a is greater than 1 in stable systems rho of a is less than 1 and when rho of a is equal to 1 uh, then in that case it is uh, it could become unstable or it could be stable it really depends on the problem okay so for instance this chair if you look at the gps position of this chair it's not really a control system it's just an object so the xt plus 1 is equal to xt all the time because there is no action it doesn't have an action in built in it so the spectral radius of a is actually equal to 1 but it is stable uh, but yeah in in some cases your even your rho of a could be equal to 1 but you might become unstable by unstable what i mean is your xt will escape to infinity without any action if it is stable even if you don't apply any action xt will go to zero asymptotically because your a the spectral radius of a is small okay are you familiar with the notion of stable well if you have taken the controls class you know what stable and unstable is right this was also taught in ec 3551 which is the feedback controls class so if you have taken that class or 3050 which is signals and systems class you have seen this stable and unstable system definition in that particular classes and i'm just extending that concept to the state space system here in this class okay so let's look at a situation of an unstable system again going back to the autonomous vehicle example i need some space okay let me erase this part so i'm going to consider two situation where an autonomous vehicle is going in the on the road and the road is a straight road and the other one is the road is a curved road and so i have a vehicle this is the center of the lane and in this case 
this is the center of the lathe. And the state is going to be uh, the distance between the vehicle and the center of the lane. Let me redraw the vehicle. And I have a vehicle. And this distance is my x of t. The distance between the center of the vehicle and the center of the lane, that's my x of t. ut equals to 0 in this example would mean that the steering angle is 0. The steering, you are trying to keep the car straight on the road. ut equals to 0 means no steering. <coughs> now consider the jamming problem. Let's assume that nu t is equal to 0 all the time. So there is no action transmitted from the wheel to the actual, uh, actual tires on, on the vehicle. What do you think will happen in this situation? Assume no disturbance, like everything is fine, no disturbance, perfect system. And this vehicle is going exactly in this direction, which is straight on the road. And it has some xt, it has some deviation from the center of the lane. What happens if this system is jammed? It will continue to go straight because, it, because there is no steering, it's going to go straight. There is no problem in this particular situation. What happens in this situation? What happens when ut is equal to 0? Then in that case, this car is going to continue to drive straight, but actually the road is is curved, okay? So in this case, uh, you may not have a problem, but in this case, you have an unstable system, and the system is unstable because of the curvature of the road, okay? Not because of the underlying system itself. In this case, the system is fine, there's no problem. Even if the jammer jams the steering angle, it doesn't matter because the road is straight, but the roads are rarely straight, it's, you always have some curves on the road. So in, this, in these situations, uh, any attack on the system could be disastrous because your vehicle could go out of the road. And that's because the system is inherently unstable in this situation. Any questions on the stable versus unstable? So the same system two different situation. In one case it's unstable, in one case it's stable. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. I'm going to consider the situation where this T, capital T, is very large. So you can assume that the system wants to have a stationary strategy. So we have to come up with an estimator. The estimator is going to look like x hat T, A plus LC, x hat T plus 1, x hat T, plus nu t l y t. Okay. The dimension of uh, nu matches the dimension of, of course, uh, u, right? Yes. The, 
kontrolu nad celou. Odpovy... I mean, doesn't matter exactly, because we have a... V is like... The uh, control matrix. Yeah, I mean the dimension. I'm trying to work out the dimension. What's oh, you are working out the dimension. So this is between, this is just 0, 1. This would be Rm cross or Rn cross M. And this would be Rm. So this is a matrix uh, with N rows. N is the number of states mm -hmm. in the system. It has n rows and m columns, and ut. So you can you have m different control inputs into the system. So that's ut. Okay. L is the observer gain. And this is your estimate. Typically, this observer gain will come from what is known as Kalman filtering, which we haven't talked about in this class. But I'm sure if you take any class in stochastic processes, you will learn about Kalman filtering in that class. So you have observer gain. Uh, you get estimate about the state uh, based on all this uh, equation. The key thing to note here is where, is the, where does this estimator sit? It actually sits on the controller. And the controller has information about new t. So we are making that assumption that if the controller sends a packet and the packet gets dropped, the controller learns about the fact that the packet has, packet has been dropped from the system. If the controller doesn't know that the packet is dropped or not, then it creates a problem because it doesn't know how to build the estimator for the system. So if you are building a system where there is a possibility of packet drop in the channel, you have to come up with a method for measuring whether the packet went through or did not go through. And if it did not go through, you have to, uh, you have, to have an acknowledgment, the fact that packet did not go through, so you can update your estimator based on that. This is more of a design issue. So, uh, so what I'm saying is in the future, when you are designing a system, you better make sure that the controller is aware of the fact whether the packet went through the channel or not. Okay? Without that acknowledgement, the problem becomes incredibly hard and you most likely will not be able to defend against an attack of this type in those situations without acknowledgement. So as simple as just having acknowledgement can greatly improve your ability to, to be able to both detect the attack and mitigate the effects of the attack. OK, so as far as the estimator design goes, you have designed the estimator using this approach. The observer gain would come from Kalman filter. Is that the same as gain? Yes, this is the Kalman, Kalman gain. Yeah, it's the same thing as Kalman gain. So I'm not going to talk about observer. Let's talk about the controller. So you can apply DP for stochastic system, dynamic programming, program for stochastic system, stochastic optimization, which and you get the following result. So suppose S is a positive definite matrix that satisfies the following recursion, S equals to Q plus A transpose S A minus nu bar
So suppose we have a positive definite matrix that satisfies this equation. Then the control strategy is given by the following matrix minus R plus B transpose S P inverse B transpose S A X hat T. Okay, so this is a response scheme for a system under intermittent jamming. Let me explain what we are doing here. So we have this state update equation and the observation equation. We have this objective function that the controller wants to minimize by picking a control strategy that maps the estimate of the state to action. So how do you solve this problem? So I'm going to assume that T is very, very large. And you know, in most situations, if T is greater than 100, you can pretty much assume that it's very large, okay? And so you can use the stationary solution. You don't have to do dynamic programming. Now, in this particular problem, when T is very large, you can apply dynamic program for stochastic optimization. Uh, and it's a fairly involved calculation. It's not that straightforward calculation. But you can apply the dynamic program for stochastic optimization to get a matrix S, where S is a strictly positive definite matrix that satisfies this fixed point equation. So S equals to Q trans Q plus blah, blah, blah. Now you notice that this new bar, which is the packet drop prob uh, probability or a parameter that defines that appears here in this particular equation, okay? So it's different from the earlier Riccati equation that we had talked about in lecture seven or eight. It's different from that Riccati equation and the way it is different is now you have this packet drop probability appearing here in this particular equation. So if you can find such an S that satisfies this recursion, you can define your optimal response strategy to be this particular matrix, this is your controller gain times the estimate of the state, control gain. Okay, and in assignment three, you have to find this particular uh, expression for S, you'll have to find the expression for S, and you have to design the control strategy. And what you will show is in the original case, when there is no attack, you have some optimal control strategy that you are using. That strategy, if you use that when there is an attack, your system is unstable and you will go off the road. So you have to switch to this particular response strategy so that you can still drive on the road and everything works fine. So that's the assignment problem actually. So I just wanted to mention that. In the next class, I'm going to talk a little bit about this particular equation and then we'll talk about estimation over a lossy network. And then we'll talk about other problems in the future classes. So thank you.